Hi, Ben. OK, thank you. Right, good morning. Welcome to this meeting of the Health and Wellbeing Board. Um, I'm Councillor Lee Chapman. I'm co-chair of the board and I'm obliged to inform you that this meeting is being live streamed and recorded. Members of the public will be able to hear the audio of the meeting and view the papers shown on the screen. I will now explain that this meeting is being held using remote technology and should any committee members experience technical difficulties during the meeting, they immediately contact the designated IT officer on the number they've already been supplied with. Everyone is requested to mute their microphones unless asked to speak. Please only use the chat function to indicate the desire to speak. Do not use anything else. So this is clear who is asking to to, to speak and the debate is heard by those listening to the audio feed. As chair, I will interpret the, stand, the council's existing standing orders in light of requirements of remote participation. At the start of the meeting, I will ask members of the board to confirm their presence and any disclosable pecuniary interests they have on the items on the agenda. I will also ask everyone that speaks during the meeting, including members of the committee, and officers to introduce themselves each time before they speak. This is so those listening know who is speaking. So um, I'll now conduct the roll call and I'll ask members to disclose any pecuniary interest they have in matters being discussed. So um, if I start the roll call now. Um, so um, Karen Bradshaw. Present, no interests, thank you. Councillor Dean Carroll. Present, no interests, thank you, Chair. David Evans. Present, no interests, Chair. Jackie Jeffrey. Present, um, only interests, the Better Care Fund um, as a voluntary sector um, contract. Thank you, Jackie. Um, Tanya. Miles, um, if you could introduce yourself. Um, uh, I will mention now that Tanya is now a permanent member of the Health and Wellbeing Board as she is now Interim Director of Adult Social Care and will be replacing Andy Begley. Um, that being said, um, uh, perhaps you'd pass a message back to our new Chief Executive and remind him that he's always welcome at the Health and Wellbeing Board. So Tanya, if you could introduce yourself, thank you. Good morning all, so I'm Tanya Miles, I'm the Interim Director for Adult Social Care and Housing and I have no interest, thank you. Councillor Ed Potter. OK. Dr Julian Povey. Uh, morning, um, I'm here. I may have some indirect interest in some of the papers in terms of the um, health and weight strategy because obviously previously practices provided the help to slim service that was decommissioned. Obviously my practice also gives flu immunisations and as part of the PCN I might potentially be part of organisations that might be giving the uh, COVID-19 sort of vaccinations but OK, Julian, that's noted. Thank you. Um, Rachel Robinson. Hi, sorry, Rachel Robinson, Director of Public Health here and I have no um, pecuniary interests. Uh, Nikki Jakes. Good morning, everybody. I'm Nikki Jakes, Chief Officer at Shropshire Partners in Care and no interests today. Thank you, Nikki. And I have. I haven't got anyone else on my list. Um, let me just check the attendees. I've also had apologies. So um, apologies if anyone 
who uh, uh well we've got some of the speakers who can introduce themselves when they come so we'll do that okay so um item one on the agenda is uh apologies um i've received apologies from uh mark brandreth uh stacy keegan louise barnett who uh sent a substitute who unfortunately now is unable to attend uh, megan nurse uh, laura fisher uh, Lynn Crawley from Healthwatch, the Chief uh, Officer. Um, uh, Vanessa Barnett, the Chair of Shropshire Healthwatch, has joined us this morning. Vanessa, are you with us? I am. OK, any any disposable no, no, for your interests? No, thank OK, you. thank you, Vanessa. You're very welcome. Thank you for substituting. Um, I've also had apologies from uh, Julie Davis from the CCG, David Stout, um, and from the community trust and Anne Marie speak from Shropshire Council. Um, in addition to Vanessa Barnett substituting, I've also got Zafar Iqbal who's substituting for Megan Nurse. Um, are you here with us this morning, Zafar? Um, yes, I am. I don't have a hand function here, so I, I don't know how to uh, contribute. So okay, so the um, so the meeting chat which is a little symbol to the right of um, the participants, uh, gives you a little message box. Um, if you indicate in the message box that you'd like to speak, um, I will um, take you in turn. Thank you. No problem at all. Good. Um, item two on the agenda is disposable pecuniary interests. Uh, these have been dealt with during the roll call. Lee. Uh, can, Hello. Please, sorry, can I can I interrupt just for completeness? I know you you read out the David Stout sent his apologies. It's Ros Green ah. here. Um, Hi, so as you were going through uh, representatives for other people, uh, you'd missed us off the list. So I'm sorry to interrupt. And you are Ros, if you'd like to introduce yeah, yourself. Yeah, certainly, if that's OK. I'm Ros Preen. I'm the Director of Finance and Strategy for Shropshire Community Healthcare Trust, and I'm representing our organisation today. And I've got no interest to declare. Fantastic. Thank you, Ros. And I'm so pleased you interrupted me. Um, uh, it means that your um, uh, presence here is noted and appreciated. Thank you for that. Um, item three on the agenda is the minutes from the last meeting. Um, and um, those have been circulated in advance. Um, I unfortunately had to apologise for the meeting and my co-chair Julian Povely capably took the chair. Um, are there any um, additions, amendments or errors that people um, have noted in the minutes that you'd like me to take account of um, before they're taken as a record, a true record of the meeting? I'll give, um, I will give um, everyone just a chance to send me a message if they have any items to add. No, OK, that's excellent. So um, I am happy to uh, move the minutes of the Health and Wellbeing Board meeting that was held on the 10th of September. Um, could I have someone second those, please, as a true record? Uh, it's Julian, I'm happy to second them. Thank you, Julian. Um, so I will now accept those as a true record and we will arrange for those to be signed. Thank you. Item four on the agenda um, is public question time. Um, we have had, we've received no public questions for this meeting, so we will carry on to item five. Item five on the agenda this morning is the, um, there's two items, there's the um, STP update and also the Healthy Lives update as part of the system update. So um, if I could take the system update first, um, perhaps uh, Jill Robinson, who's going to um, present this, could um, introduce yourself and present the paper, please.
Uh, Lee, Jill might be having problems. I think both she and Sam um, on the link they had couldn't ah, speak. Ah, yes, just, yes, can't speak. OK, I've just, so I've um, just resent them the link, so I'm not sure whether Jill signed back in yet, but um, I'm happy okay. to um, do this well, if that's could, helpful. Uh, we could or we can take the other half of uh, agenda item five and give them a few more minutes to uh, to get in. Should we do that? That's fine um, by me. Yeah, Val, could we uh, could we do the healthy lives part of this um, first? I appreciate that's going to um, twist us around with the slide deck, but if we could do that, that would be appreciated. And we're going to get a nice little, there's going to sneaky preview here of the uh, item five STP update, and Val's item is just the paper which Val's going to present. Isn't that right, Val? So have we got Val or? Strangely quiet. OK, Julian, so um, in the absence of Val for her part, perhaps I could take you back up on your offer to um, do the STP update. My apologies for the confusion to the attendees. I think, I think it was Dave who offered to do the update. I mean, I'm very happy to do the update, but I think Dave Evans. Um, fine. Yeah, excellent. Well, that's fine. Well, da D David, that would be great. Thank you. I thought I'd got out of it then for a second, very, Julian. Very close, very close. <laughs> OK, uh, just, thank you. Just, just introduce yourself, David, before you start, if you wouldn't mind. No, that's fine. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I'm David Evans. I'm the joint AO for the two CCGs and the um, Integrated Care System Lead Director. Um, so just want to give a bit of an update in terms of where we are around the system and how that work is progressing. If I could have the next slide, please. So um, as you will all recall, because we've had this discussion a number of times, we were um, uh, the NHS was looking at setting up uh, STPs, Sustainability and Transformation Partnerships, back in 2016. These have evolved as we've progressed over the last few years. We developed the long term plan in 2019, although worth pointing out that ours hasn't yet been formally signed off. And that set a timeline for STPs to move towards integrated care systems. Uh, so in a sense it's evolving. Um, it brings together providers and commissioners and, and by commissioners I include local authorities in that uh, together with other partners. So for example on our ICS shadow board we have representatives from uh, both SPIC, we have the voluntary sector uh, and we also have both health watches represented. And this is about taking a lead on planning and commissioning services for our population in the future to provide leadership for the overall health and care system uh, and look at developing an overall health and care strategy across the whole of Shropshire, including Telford and Rekin. Um, we currently are entering an assurance process uh, and we are on track to become an ICS in April 2021. Um, just a couple of things I'll add to that in terms of as I say, we've established an ICS shadow board which has been meeting for some time. That includes providers, commissioner, local authorities, uh, voluntary and community sector partners and health watch. The, um, the latest guidance on ICS development uh, does mandate that there should be an ICS lead director. Um, we had a number of discussions within the system uh, and recognised that actually it would be probably the best route to take to combine the AO role of the CCG with the ICS lead director role. Uh, and that's what's been agreed by all, uh, all parties. Next slide, please. Uh, we have an independent chair to the ICS Shadow Board and that is Neil McKay uh, and it meets monthly. So as I say, we've now uh, in the past few weeks, uh, because of some of the concerns uh, related particularly to SATH 
around uh, CQC inspections and special measures. The system as a whole has been working to develop a system improvement plan, which we delivered to NHSEI um, about 10 days ago. It focuses on looking at how the system can work more collaboratively and together to address some of those key challenges. So that's particularly around uh, demand management and reduction of emergencies and admissions at the front door. Um, I have to say the system improvement plan is a two year plan, but the first six months uh, is very closely aligned to the winter plan. So I'm going to try and not steal too much of Sam's thunder when she talks later, but it is about reduction of demand. It is about trying to keep people away from the front door. And the reason that's important is we know that because of the staffing challenges that the trust have, there is a um, higher likelihood, particularly out of hours, that someone would get admitted uh, into a bed than perhaps in other systems. And we want to look at how we can maintain people safely at home to help with flow and discharge, uh, although just worth pointing out that we still do have relatively low delayed uh, transfers of care in terms of discharge. The back door does work fairly well, notwithstanding, of course, the challenge at the front door. Implementation of NHS Think 1-1 first, that's due to go uh, live on Monday and will be fully rolled out by December the 1st. And that is about a different point of contact for people so that they ring 111 first, obviously, uh, and they will reroute them to areas where they may be able to get or will be able to get treatment uh, and diagnosis rather than necessarily having to go to the A&E departments. The introduction of same day emergency care on both sites at Princess Royal and Royal Shrewsbury and the need to smooth peaks in A&E demand. We quite often see at both sites um, what we tend to call bunching of ambulances, i.e. ambulances turn up at one time. Now, both departments are fairly small and clearly that puts an additional strain and constraint on the ability of staff working in those departments to see and manage uh, those surges in demand. So we're working with West Midland Am Ambulance to see what we can do about that. Next slide, please. David, before you go on to the next slide, um, would it be appropriate for me to just ask a question about the NHS Think 111? Uh, happy to. Yeah, it's just um, <laughs> I had some personal experience of this uh, about uh, a month ago. I got bitten by a dog while I was out mountain biking. It'll teach me to go mountain biking. Um, and I rang um, NHS 111 because um, I thought antibiotics cover might mm. be appropriate. Mm. And it was everything that I could do to stop 111 getting me to go to accident and emergency, which I found okay. really interesting. So from a system perspective, I was expecting them to um, to steer me towards um, um, ShropDoc or the equivalent. Um, yep. to, to get a GP to speak to me on the phone. I knew that there was an opportunity to get um, a script um, electronically and to be collected. Um, and uh, on, I, I tried NHS 111 twice, and on both occasions they wanted me to go to A&E, which I thought was really interesting. OK, um, so I, so I, I guess my challenge back is, do, are you confident that NHS 11 is actually going to do anything other than adopt the least risk approach, which is to send you to um, A&E as they seem uh, to be? Uh, we, I, I suppose I'd say we're hopeful, Lee, um, yep. but, but nonetheless, it, it, it's like all of these things. It, it's working on. Um, protocols and and an algorithm. Now, um, I wouldn't want to go into specifics around um, individual clinical presentations, but of, of course, course someone who's, who's had a dog bite may need tetanus, for example, and where yeah. would be the best place to go and get tetanus out of ours. Um, yeah. However, I will take that feedback back because I would have thought that we ought to be able to handle a what sounds like a relatively minor dog bite in the community without having to send someone off to A&E. Um, yeah, uh, but no, well, I, think it, was in, I think it was interesting. I mean, I did cover the I did cover the um, I did cover the um, uh, tetanus because I, I, I got bitten by a dog two years ago. Same same deal. 
and I did go to a &E and they did give me a tetanus. So they're, they're good for life now once you've had one. So um, but yeah, I appreciate that. And I, I, I know that as a chairman, it's always weird if you bring a, a personal experience. But this was really relevant. And I just thought it was worth airing because um, I get the fact that it's an algorithm. But, you know, um, we need to be very careful how we um, how we set these things up, don't we? Uh, absolutely. And I will take that back Lee and and you know clearly mountain biking is more dangerous than even I thought it was um, <laughs> but, 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 yeah. but joking aside um, you know the, the, the whole point of NHS 111 is both in terms of reducing demand on overstretched A&E departments and, and, and this is a national initiative I should say uh, yes. but also actually it's more convenient for patients not to have to uh, go off to A&E if they can be treated locally and that's always been one of the aspirations of our system to do that Absolutely. I think Julian wanted to come in. Julian, briefly, and then we'll go back to uh, the slides. Just for a public health uh, bit, really, just in case anyone's listening and watching, you're OK for life with tetanus once you've had a, your initial course of five, unless you have a, a very dirty tetanus wound, so if you're digging in a field with manure, then you may need immunoglobulin. So just to just sort of case people are listening there, you do need the whole course of five to be protected. And then there still are certain circumstances where you might also need the immunoglobulin, uh, particularly if there's any farmers or sort of uh, people listening, you can get very dirty wounds. But I'm sorry you got bitter and I hope, you, hope you're better. That's fine. Thank you, Julian. And uh, thank you for that timely advice. That's much appreciated. Thank you. Um, David, back to your slides. Apologies for the interruption. No, not at all, Lee. Uh, so I just want to touch on COVID briefly um, because clearly uh, we've seen significant COVID activity um, in both in, in the first wave but also now moving into wave two. We've still retained the structure that we've had in since the beginning of wave one. So we have a silver uh, system command structure in place which manages a, a, an operational level our system response. Uh, we then have a gold command which is the chief execs of respective organisations plus directors of adult social care. Um, who look at what's happening, whether we need to take other actions. Uh, it's chaired by myself um, because the, uh, the CCGs at the beginning of the pandemic were given the system responsibility in terms of response. Uh, but I say all the key partners are on there. Uh, we obviously are very mindful and this is a very fast changing environment and has been for the last uh, seven or eight months, mindful of all of the information that comes out of NHSEI uh, and Public Health England, etc. Uh, in terms of vaccination, if I just touch on that very quickly, uh, this is a very complex, fast moving uh, uh, environment, as people will appreciate from daily news uh, bulletins on the BBC and elsewhere. Other news outlets are available. Um, the intention at the moment looks like there will be some vaccine supply ready and tested and uh, approved prior to Christmas, but that the majority of um, the vaccine release will be post Christmas. There are cohorted groups uh, that will be priority for vaccination uh, and that starts with uh, things like uh, over 80s uh, and care home. Uh, residents etc works then down through um, care staff including NHS staff etc etc so there are about 11 cohorts identified uh, from memory uh, but it is a very logistically challenging operation I have to say it's moving very quickly the anticipation is that a significant proportion of the vaccine will be delivered in primary care and again we're just working through some of the logistics but it will need system input and oversight not least because of the complexities of some of the vaccines so the Pfizer one for example uh, has to be initially stored at minus 70 degrees most GP surgeries don't have uh, fridges or freezers that go down to that level although once it's made up it's stable for five days but again there's the logistics around uh, all of that that's proving uh, challenging for us but I'm confident that we will be ready to go and we're having regular updates at gold. Next slide please. 
Uh, winter planning, I wasn't going to touch too much on this because I know Sam's going to pick this up uh, as a separate agenda item. Uh, so uh, really it is about COVID, it is about making sure that we continue to vaccinate our population against flu and we are doing quite well on that at the moment. Uh, and as I say, we've talked about NHS 111 first. The, the primary aim for us this winter because we know it's going to be challenging is wherever possible uh, to keep patients away from A&E and to use other services to look after them locally or at home. Next slide please. Um, so in terms of transformation and system delivery, we are looking at transformation across the system, uh, not just within individual organisations, although there are elements within organisations. So for the past three months or so, this has been particularly around looking at system wide restoration and recovery and trying to make sure that as we restored services, wherever possible, we put transformation in at the same time. So locked in that learning that we gained through COVID uh, and that first wave, so things like uh, telephone assessments, um, telephone appointments, etc. We do want to make sure that as we restore services, we try and tackle some of our health inequalities issues and embed the prevention agenda as we move forward. We've got three programme boards that report into uh, the ICS. They are Community in Place Base, which is chaired by David Stout, uh, Mental Health, Learning, Disabilities and Autism, which is chaired by Cathy Riley, the Managing Director for Shropshire uh, for MPFT, and Acute and Specialist, which is chaired by myself. There are agreed priorities that link back to the winter plan, the long term plan, and also now the system improvement plan. Although, as I said previously, there's a very close alignment between the winter plan and the system improvement plan. Uh, we do recognise there are some significant challenges we've got this winter uh, in terms of uh, transformation that is around the fragility of the workforce overall, competing demands because clearly we've got winter, we've got uh, another surge in COVID, we're trying to restore services to pre-COVID levels which is proving challenging uh, and also the CCGs are currently embarked on management of change with the whole staff, uh, so that is giving us some capacity problems. Next slide please. So in terms of workforce, we've got a workforce plan as part of our system response um, and it, it relates to the NHS people plan overall, which uh, came out earlier this year. It is looking at how we work collaboratively across all of our partners and indeed we did that very effectively during wave one where we had a uh, agreement, uh, a mutual aid agreement uh, across all partners in health and social care if one particular partner got into staffing difficulties. I should add we are beginning to see sickness rates related to COVID. They may not be specifically because we've got staff off uh, due to COVID but it is about whether they've been in contact etc. So we're running around about 10-11% at the moment uh, in some areas. Um, so uh, just to note that we've got a comprehensive delivery plan however in terms of that people plan with some key priorities which are set out on the slide there. Uh, next slide please. Oh that's me finished. Uh, happy to okay. take questions Lee. Thank you, David. So um, if uh, um, attendees could indicate on the chat if they'd like to uh, comment or uh, ask questions of David. That's it, you see, David, you've the the assurance part of your presentation was done, delivered so seamlessly that uh, to be fair, the um, the backup paper which um, supports this was um, uh, pretty comprehensive. I don't think um, any of us know what's coming down the tracks. There's a degree of uncertainty in the system simply because of where we are. And certainly in relation to COVID, Lee, as you all know, both Shropshire and Telford are seeing still increasing rates within the community. Now, <clears throat> clearly lockdown that started hasn't yet, <coughs> excuse me, hasn't yet impacted and we hope it will do. Uh, but nonetheless, we are seeing uh, increasing rates, Telford more than Shropshire, but, but nonetheless Shropshire is going up as well. 
Okay, that's great. Um, yeah, and and I'm I'm sure that um, uh, Rachel Robinson, our director of public health, who is on an item later, um, uh, will perhaps expand the discussion on this um, a little more. Okay, thank you, uh, David, for stepping in, and apologies that um, Jill Robinson wasn't able to join a, join the meeting at this point. Um, so the recommendation to um, to the Health and Wellbeing Board is that we receive um, the update. Um, I'm happy to propose that from the chair. Um, will anyone second that? You're happy to second that, David? I, I am. Yep, OK, that's excellent. So um, if I don't get any comments on the chat from members of the board, um, I will accept receipt of the um, STP update. Uh, that's much appreciated. Thank you, David. Um, the next item is the Healthy Lives update um, and the paper um, has gone out and is um, presented as part of the agenda for this meeting. Um, Val, perhaps you'd like to introduce yourself um, and uh, talk us through the paper. Thanks Lee, yes I'm happy to do that. Um, I'm just drawing up my paper at the moment, which seems to have disappeared. So I'm, I'm big apologies about that. I think it's a technical enjoyment today with the meeting. <laughs> um, so this is the um, Healthy Lives update. Um, I'm Val Cross and I'm a health and wellbeing officer for um, public health in Shropshire County. Um, we're not hearing you, Val. Um, are you muted, Val? No, you don't look as if you're muted on the screen, but I can't hear you. The joys of remote meetings. Val. OK, fine. So Val is having. She's either having technical issues or somebody has telephoned her in the middle of her presentation. OK, nothing further from Val. Right, we will we'll come back to Val and we will move on to the next item, which is an agenda item six. So my understanding um, is, David, that um, Sam Tilly has been unable to join us for the uh, meeting and therefore um, you get your wish to um, present the winter plan paper, which is the um, which is item six on the agenda. Um, and that has been tabled as part of the agenda to the meeting. Um, there isn't a slideshow with it, David. Do you want to um, talk us through it? Ah, we have it on the screen. Thank you. Uh, I am obviously the B team today, not the A team. So uh, apologies for that. We've, we've clearly got some technical difficulties. Um, so if I just quickly go through this paper, Lee, and, and again, I'm happy to take any questions either as we go along uh, or at the end, whichever uh, uh, health and wellbeing board members would prefer. Clearly, we do winter planning every year, so, so this is not new. Um, but there are some uh, unusual considerations, obviously, this year, not least COVID, uh, not least wanting to make sure that um, the flu vaccination programme, wherever possible, got an early start or recognising that the increase range of the flu vaccination programme this year has impacted on supply. Uh, so not everyone has yet had the vaccination that perhaps we would have liked to have done. Uh, and 
part of the challenge then around that goes back to the logistics around COVID vaccination in terms of there has to be a gap between someone having their flu vaccination and their COVID vaccination. But I won't go into the technical details around that at this stage. Um, what we've tried to make sure though is that this year we, uh, particularly in terms of winter planning, we we took the line that system was default rather than individual organisations. We wanted this to be about um, reorganisation of system priorities, recognising the challenges that we were also trying to uh, restore services at the same time, uh, make sure that we still had pan-organisational governance, but that supported solutions uh, and, and enabled rapid decision making. Um, we wanted to make sure that we deployed staff appropriately to support priorities um, and that we were looking at embracing change as we go through this. We also wanted to make sure, however, that we learned from what hadn't worked particularly well in previous years. So what, what had worked well, what didn't work well and what could we take forward? Um, initially, we asked for organisations to come forward as schemes and there were more than 30 put forward across the range of system partners, um, a lot of which, as I said earlier, were looking at admissions avoidance uh, and or discharge. We then uh, went through a process of narrowing those down before we got into a place where uh, we had a range of schemes that we were going to take forward. And those included things like expansion of the rapid response service into the Shrewsbury area, particularly uh, looking at how we could use therapy services in a different way at the front door, NHS 111, etc. Uh, so I wasn't going to go into much more detail than that, Lee, but I'm happy to take questions. Thank you, David, um, and thanks for um, picking this up. Um, unfortunately, um, unfortunately for you, although Sam can't speak, um, she can hear, so she will be able to provide you with a critique on your presentation of her paper later. Uh, <laughs> so, um, the uh, thank you for presenting the paper and um, if anyone's got any questions perhaps they could indicate on the um, on the chat function I think it's really interesting um, seeing the uh, the number and range of um, interventions um, uh, as part of the winter planning um, and clearly um, lots of opportunities to try and take some of that pressure off um, And I think um, Vanessa would like to come in. Um, Vanessa, over to you. Thank you very much. I just wanted to say as Health Watch Shropshire, um, we're starting another new hot topic. Um, and particularly, we're trying to learn about the experiences of both hospital patients and care home residents in respect of the visiting arrangements that have been made for families and friends when visiting in person has been so restricted. Mm -hmm. And um, we're hoping that to capture a lot of good practice that can be introduced more widely and it presumably can feed into the, the work of the, uh, the new ways of working group. Thank you. OK, thank you, Vanessa, for that. That's that's helpful. Um, OK, so um, in terms of the um, winter capacity paper, or the winter plan from the CCGs, um, I haven't got any other indications of uh, anyone wanting to speak and contribute. Um, the feedback's very positive, David. You'll be pleased to know on your presentation of the paper. So um, I am going to um take us through to item seven on the agenda um well actually no what i should do first of all my apologies um there is a recommendation in the uh the paper and that is that the health and well-being board uh welcome and accept the um shropshire telford and reekin ccg's winter plan report um and i'm very happy um to um propose that um is accepted by the health and well-being board um, if there's any dissension, perhaps um, members of the board could indicate on the chat feature. No, that's excellent. OK, well, we will take that as um, uh, accepted and um, we'll move on to uh, very much part of the same plan, but presented from the perspective of adult social care, which is item <coughs> seven on the agenda, which is the adult social care winter plan. 
and I um, I'm pleased to um, uh, to welcome Tanya Miles um, to uh, take us through the paper and I understand you've got some slides Tanya if you could Good introduce morning. yourself that would be great Good morning, it's Tanya Miles, I'm the Interim Director for Adult Social Care and Housing. Have we got the slides up, Michelle? Yep, we have. Right. Um, so I've got colleagues with me, Trisha Blackstock and Kate Garner, who will step us through the detailed slides. But as a way of introduction, um, as David has just said, winter presents a significant challenge to our health and social care services during this pandemic. Um, as a council, we always contribute towards a system wide winter plan. This is the first year the Minister of State launched the National Adult Social Care Winter Plan. Setting out actions the government is taken at a national level to support those who provide and receive care. The plan outlines the actions every local authority and every care provider must be taking to maintain our collective efforts to keep the virus at bay and ensure that we're ready for a challenging winter period. The Shropshire Council Adult Social Care Winter Plan sets out how the council, along with the voluntary sector and statutory partners, will work together to protect and support local residents, including those who are clinically vulnerable, our providers, our workforce, as far as reasonably possible, from an increase in the, from an, an increase in the incidence of the flu and COVID-19. The guidance is clear that the first priority to councils, care providers and NHS providers is to prevent infections in care homes and to protect staff and residents. And whilst the winter plan does focus on care homes, the priorities for us as a system is about supporting all members of our communities and in all our settings. The plan covers the period of October 2020 and runs up until the end of March 21. The plan is split into five themes and Kate and Trish will now take us through these themes, um, starting with Kate on theme A, which is slide seven. Thank you. Thanks, Tanya. Ooh, are we at slide seven? Perhaps it's slide eight. <laughs> so we would, we just, oh, are we moving forward, Michelle? These slides. So the. Um, Could you just introduce yourself, Kate, please? Yes, yeah, sorry, Lee. Yes, Kate Garner, a service manager within Adult Social Care for Community Partnerships and and Day Day Opportunities. So um, as Tanya said, the plan is split out into a number of themes, and so we've organised our slides. Um, to highlight each of these themes and then the detail underneath. And uh, so theme A is about the overarching work within the system. And uh, we've um, identified uh, the activity that really sits within public health, the care provider market, primary care and the local authority. And it's very much how we work together to um, have things like uh, the co-production approach, um, reducing inequalities, involving care providers in our planning. So a lot of that is how we're going to work and those fundamentals to give us a good strong base. Um, and then we've pulled out a few um, particular areas. So uh, we have, uh, we know that there's been a lot of concern and interest in care home visiting and um, so we do have a care home welfare team within the council that uh, works closely with public health and is in regular you know, daily, weekly contact with, um, with our care settings and supporting with um, the queries, the concerns that providers have and of course families and residents have uh, about, um, about visiting. So that's an important area for us. Um, uh, another area that we can pick out there is day opportunities, which is my area. And um, I'm pleased to say that our day services and our, actually our, our actual buildings stayed open during um, lockdown and, and throughout. And going forward, um, what we're focusing on now is how to deliver services both from those centres, but within the community, 
from within people's homes and digitally. So a whole range of options. And COVID has been <laughs> given us an opportunity to really look at doing things differently. Um, and then finally thinking about digital technology. Um, again, another opportunity to really think about a range of things that people are able to do within their home. So supported living, it is somebody's home and what people can do collectively in their bubbles. And we have uh, things like um, the OMI projectors and uh, lots of seen big increase in, in digital technology use. So those are some of those areas we've picked out on, under that theme. I think I'm moving over to Trish now to pick up from hopefully slide 11. <laughs> OK, thank you very much. Um, good morning, everyone. I'm Patricia Blackstock, Service Manager within Adult Social Care. Um, I'm not actually sure if we're on slide 11 yet, yeah. but if I could just touch on um, some of the themes. Sorry, bear with me in slide seven. Um, so. Sorry, bear with me. So, Carol, um, if you move, could you, you move having, the slides yeah, on? Sorry, theme, just having technical B. difficulties. Could you move the slides on to theme B, please, Karen, which is, and then again, and again. There we go. OK, thank you very much. So in looking at um, some of the overarching work within um, adults within um, care and home setting, we've done quite a lot of work in terms of co-production, um, working with our providers um, in care home planning, um, implementing guidance to our care homes and also um, a lot of work in terms of personal um, protective equipment. Um, so we've supported care homes in relation to those activities. Um, I'm very sorry, for, um, I'm just having some technical difficulties in terms of the slides, so please bear with me. It's OK, move the slides on, Karen, please, to the next slide. Thank you. OK, so in terms of um, testing, um, Yes, we have um, good capacity in terms of um, testing. So we have made it a local decision to test our dumb care providers in Shropshire on a fortnightly basis. Um, providers are also supported through our care home um, via our care home support team and testing is continually supported. In addition, um, we um, make returns to central government um, and um, we monitor the provider market um, whilst engaging in testing um, PHE and um, PH reporting um, testing outcomes whenever there's a break, whenever um, an outbreak occurs. We also have a capacity tracker um, which reports and monitor any issues um, which are also fed into our risk management system. So testing issues, um, e.g. late testing returns, these are all collated and fed into um, PHA Public Health England and testing to central government. Next slide, please. Per in terms of personal protective equipment, so providers can access um, this supply chain um, and we've also set up emergency and um, public, uh, sorry, emergency PPE supply portal uh, which all providers who support Shropshire residents are able to access. So next slide please. Theme C um, of our winter plan this looks at collaboration across health and, and care setting um, particularly focusing on safe discharges and prevention of avoidable admissions um, and social prescribing. So the next slide um, Next slide, please. Goes into more details in terms of how we've done that. So Shropshire's Discharge to Assess Hub ensures that when a, per, when a patient is ready to be discharged from hospital, they can be transferred without delay to an appropriate setting. The 
hub within the hospital settings is a multidisciplinary health and social care partnership who work together to ensure that all elements are in place um, to enable a safe discharge of a patient from hospital. At the other spectrum, and um, colleagues actually touched on this earlier, we have an admission avoidance service um, operating within Shropshire, um, which operates a strong partnership between the Council and Shropshire Community Health Tr Trust. The admission avoidance scheme in Shropshire was relaunched in November, and this is a seven day a week clinically led service um, which delivers a mixed model of clinical and non-clinical domiciliary care admission avoidance support to individuals um, that need it. Now to date since launch we've had 19 referrals from a number of sources, um, some of which are um, um, 111, A&E, Frailty, IDT and ICF. Now the clinical um, element offers a seven day um, service um, from 8 till 10 p.m. So 8 a.m. till 10 p.m. with a two hour window um, in terms of responding. Um, the dom domiciliary care element operates a 24 seven um, element, which is actually split um, between day and also nighttime support. In addition to that, um, and to support admission avoidance, and um, flow within the hospital setting, Shropshire confirmed a number of winter schemes um, in um, for 2021. Um, some of these, I've mentioned the AA, um, but we also have a living carer scheme within Shropshire, and this is to support and enhance um, discharges to an individual's home. Um, we have a carer, two carers in a car, um, which we are piloting, um, particularly around the rural areas within Shropshire. Now, traditionally, um, these areas were much more difficult to source um, support in terms of getting um, dom domiciliary care. So we are piloting that um, within the rural areas for this winter period. We have strengthened the voluntary sector in terms of supporting um, to enhance um, discharges for individuals that may need more support in the community to maintain them. Um, we've also expanded our um, start service. This is our in-house domiciliary care um, provision. Um, we have um, financial incentives for providers, again, to enable speedier and more timely support um, when we need to facilitate a discharge um, back home. And um, there's also community engagement and activation. So we're doing a lot of work with our voluntary sector workers. Um, a voluntary sector sub, um, schemes. Okay, um, the next slide, I think I'm handing back to um, Kate to have a look at the, to, to talk you through the winter plan. Yeah, thank you, Trish. I'll get much better at saying next slide, please. Um, <laughs> this one. So theme D is, um, uh, uh, relates to supporting people who receive social care of a workforce and carers and as you can see we have a number of schemes sitting underneath this theme and a, a great deal of activity um, so the headings themselves don't really um, demonstrate just how much um, is going on um, um, underneath each each one so if I can just have the next slide please Karen just looking um, in a bit more detail at the winter support service that Trish just referred to. So we have an all year round uh, wellbeing independence service delivered by a consortium of voluntary and community sector organisations. And this winter support service is an enhancement of that. Uh, so additional capacity being brought into those organisations to um, work with us and with the health and care system um, as a whole. Uh, much more closely, uh, really good referral uh, mechanism in place, very clear about who is um, eligible, which is pretty much anyone who we feel um, will benefit from support that will enable them to stay at home safe, well, and, and um, avoid those, those avoidable hospital discharges. And if somebody is coming home um, from hospital, that they're supported to be able to stay there and, and be well. So this is really tapping into all the resources that we have within 
our community. So it's not just about what those organisations do, like Age UK and Stratton Mayfair, um, RVS, etc. It's about making sure that they are referring and connecting people into things like the local COVID support groups, the organisations that are organising the hot meal delivery, everything that we we know is out there. So our community reassurance team is working really closely. And um, we also have set up um, a referral mechanism for primary care networks, community and care coordinators to be able to refer in as well. So we're really pleased with this development. Um, next slide, please. Uh, mental health um, support and well-being, both for our workforce, but also um, for our Shropshire residents as well. Um, we invested um, and, and mind invested time, energy, um, a really good partnership to develop um, schemes, support, both online resources and face-to-face uh, -face and drop-in support really since March. And so we now do have a, a good set of resources for a range of scenarios and situations that people may find themselves in, as well as a more general how to keep ourselves well um, mentally and, and to um, be able to talk to people and, and to access, regardless of where somebody is on that scale of, of, of mental um, good health or, or, or poor health. Uh, next slide, please. Um, in four more carers, where would we be without them? We'd be in a bit of a pickle, wouldn't we? So um, the, we have, again, just moving on and continuing with what we put in place uh, back, in, back in March. So, so those specific things like uh, supplying carers with, um, with what we call a pass or a letter that gives carers confidence to be out um, on essential business and to, and to show and to others if they feel they need to. This is why I'm here. I care for somebody. Um, I have people reliant on me. This is why I'm, I'm, I'm traveling. This is why I'm in the shop, that sort of thing. Uh, so we're still sending those out. Uh, we've got um, information page on shop choices. And then we, over the months, we have um, invested in additional support for specific providers. Um, learning disabilities and autism. So, so that's good. And so taking part in a for you have supported us with that work. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and when we think about our more formal um, arrangements for support for informal carers, we do have our carer support service, which is currently delivered by Crossroads Together. And um, we've also just run a pilot with an organisation called Mobilise, who offer online support. And that's gone, that's gone down really well. And we're really pleased with the feedback and the outputs and outcomes um, from, from the pilot. Uh, so, yeah, I'd, I would um, recommend anyone to go and have a quick look at Mobilise and see what they, they provide. Just uh, weekly emails, very informative, very dynamic and interactive um, and responsive. And I think for those people who are able to access um, and engage and communicate through digital means, uh, this, this is a really great offer. Next slide, please. And um, I think this is, yeah, this is my final slide. Um, our housing services work really closely with, with ICS and therefore part of our health and care system to facilitate hospital discharges when, when there's a housing need. And then if we're thinking more about the prevention and um, avoiding hospital admissions, uh, we have our cold weather provision and also our severe weather emergency um, protocols for keeping people who, who don't have their own home, um, permanent own home, keeping them as safe and well as possible and supported. And I think that's, that's me. So I'll pass back to Tanya. I think the next slide is myself. So Trisha Blackstock again, um, Service Manager, Adult Social Care. So I'll just um, take you quickly through um, theme E, which is supporting the system. 
Um, so the home support team maintains information that have been published on their website, um, specifically around financial support um, that's been offered um, to their local social care market. Um, in terms of market sustainability, we work with um, our local partners to engage with the service uh, continuity and care market review and when requested um, could be completion of a self assessment of health um, and local market management, sorry, local market management um, contingency planning. Um, we also continue to promote all financial support that's available and encourage providers to access this. Um, we continue to meet regularly with providers to discuss any issues that they may have, look at ways forward and to support and support uh, them with um, service continuity and business viability. Um, so the approach to sustainability is about supporting to prevent failure and to ensure that providers have robust contingency planning in place. Um, it's also about sort of preparing us and ensuring that level of preparedness um, for any worsening situations due to unpredictable nature of the pandemic. Um, and in the event of a provider failure, we have an established response um, that we would um, implement. Um, in relation to capacity, um, we have got a, um, a tracker um, which we monitor. Um, currently, we know that there is, you know, very good capacity within the market. Um, in terms of our dumb care hours, we have um, around about 2,001 hours, 2,100 hours per week. Um, that was the information from October. Um, the national capacity tracker also evidences that 116 homes um, have reported on their current occupancy level and overall vacancy across the market is around 13 percent uh, which means currently we have more beds that we would have done normally um, at this time of the year. Can we have the next slide please? Thank you Trish and Kate so just to conclude if I may thank you very much for giving us the time to go through this detailed plan this morning. Um, as we head into winter, the intensive work done in, in the preceding months on market support and resilience and ensuring we have the right support and the right resources in place to help our population, our robust partnership working and significant outbreak management workplace puts in a really strong position this winter. Shropshire is really fortunate to have a strong and resilient voluntary and community sector, which complements the activity of the, of the health and social care statutory bodies. Um, if I may, Chair, I'd like to say a very big thank you to everyone supporting people in Shropshire um, across, across the whole system. Um, we will get through this winter together. Um, so I'd like to uh, welcome the endorsement of this winter plan by the board um, and note that the winter plan will be published and will be communicated to all our partners and care providers and will be on our website. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Tanya, and a special thanks to uh, Kate and Tricia for presenting portions of those slides. That was very, very informative. I'm, I'm glad I gave you some special um, uh, leeway to go beyond my normal six slide limit. So thank you for that. Um, I'm, I'm pleased that you took the opportunity and I would echo that to thank everyone um, across uh, the economy of Shropshire, um, informal carers, the voluntary sector, um, NHS and care colleagues for all of the work they're continuing to do. Um, Penny would like to come in. Perhaps you could introduce yourself, Penny. Hello, I'm Penny Basin, STP Programme Manager, and supporting the, COVID, the community COVID response. Can you hear me? Yes, Penny. Excellent. Excellent. I'm not sure. I can't see the slide, so I'm not entirely sure how my tech is going to hold up. But anyway, I just wanted to say that one bit of the plan, obviously, it's a really comprehensive plan and um, interesting to listen to. I wish I could see the slides, um, but I have been a little bit part of it. And one of that area is around which I'm really excited about is the um, is the uplift to the wellbeing and independence contract because that's been a real joint endeavour and I just sort of wanted to make mention of that. So the, the uplift to that service has been made possible by working with the primary care networks 
um, along with social care and other partners to kind of bring together a holistic service where we can have referral routes from social care for the clinically extremely vulnerable, but also other vulnerable within our communities that we come across. And then also for primary care to be able to make those referrals in as well in the same in the same way. I think we have a bit more work to do to kind of really communicate with um, and make best use of the service with primary care. So I suppose that's why one reason why I wanted to mention it today, just with our CCG colleagues in the room um, wanting to just commitment, I guess, to work closely with us to make sure we make the best use of this service and really work collaboratively on it going forward. Thank you, Penny. Um, uh, a, a timely reminder. Um, and uh, yeah, thanks. Thanks for that. Um, uh, Councillor Dean Carroll would like to come in. Can't hear you, Dean. Are you? No, Dean. OK, um, Nikki, we'll come back to you, Dean, if you can get on. Um, <laughs> uh, no, no. So uh, Nikki Jakes would like to uh, to come in. Nikki, if you could introduce yourself. Thank you, Chair. I'm Nikki Jakes. I'm Chief Officer at Shropshire Partners in Care. And Shropshire Partners in Care, SPIC, were, were involved in developing the winter plan. And we, we really appreciate that input on our our opportunity to represent the independent care sectors as well and absolutely welcome and endorse it. I just wanted to raise just a note of caution for all members of Health and Wellbeing Board around the capacity in the market because whilst that is absolutely fabulous for supporting um, winter activity, I do think I need to censor that with a note of caution around the increased capacity being identified at this time of year by both care homes and domiciliary care, whilst welcome to support winter activity, does pose a challenge for those businesses from a financial point of view. Care homes in particular have been really hard hit by uh, falling occupancy levels and that has a direct financial effect on them. And I, I you know, I wouldn't be doing them a service if I didn't just raise that note of caution for us to be aware of. And we welcome the council's support to those care homes and to all care providers with their ongoing welfare calls and absolutely support um, the monitoring of the financial risk. But I just think it needed noting today. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Nikki. And actually, I'm glad that you did because um, I think I probably would have brought up a similar level of caution, particularly around the um, the level of um, capacity um, issues and how that impacts on sustainability. But as you say, um, I think um, g given the circumstances and that risk, the council, as we know, has a responsibility around sustainability of market. And so uh, the steps that the council is putting in obviously um, make sure as best as we can that we understand some of those fragilities and that we're in a position to respond where where we can where necessary um, uh, i just wanted to see whether um, dean carroll who wanted to come in has now managed to um, get back in dean have we got you oh, can you hear me yes we can hear you dean go ahead just introduce yourself oh, if you wouldn't it. mind <laughs> Councillor Dean Carroll, I'm a portfolio holder for Adult Social Care, Public Health and Climate Change on Shropshire Council. I just wanted to echo some of what you and Tanya had said in terms of thanks to the officers presenting and thanks to everybody in the adult social care sector in Shropshire for keeping the sector going through some of the most challenging and difficult times that we've um, that we've ever known. Uh, I would encourage everybody once the well, the report's now um, been released, I would encourage everybody to read the, the full report. It is well worth it. I know it's about 40 or so pages, but actually they're not difficult to read. They're very accessible and it's very well worth it. So I'd encourage everybody to read the report in full. Thank you, Chair. 
Thank you, Dean. Yes, and on that note, um, if I could request to presenters to make sure that their slideshows are made available and that they um, they're also on the council's website as part of the um, minutes for the meeting, because I'm thinking particularly even some of the attendees have had struggles um, accessing um, the uh, the images as we've been going through them, so that would be helpful. Um, any more? comments, questions, queries on the um, adult social care winter plan. OK, so I, I, I'd like to propose the recommendation is that we um, accept and endorse Shropshire Council's adult social care winter plan. Uh, Dean, would you be happy to second that for me? Yes, yes, I would. If you can yep, hear me. Thank sir. you. Yep, we can. Thank you, Dean, for seconding that. Um, if I don't have any messages on the chat from anyone who is unhappy with that, I'll formally accept the recommendation to um, accept and endorse the plan. Um, thank you to all the contributors. Um, now I'll move on to item five. Um, I'm pleased that um, Val has been able to um, come back and join us. Um, we missed out on Val's um, Healthy Lives update, which was the um, the other part of agenda item five. Um, so perhaps this is a um, this is a verbal update. Um, the paper has been um, presented <coughs> as part of the agenda. Um, Val, are you available to talk us through this? I am. Yes. Apologies for that. Uh, my computer just completely crashed. So um, I'm, um, I'm Val Cross and I'm a health and wellbeing officer in public health at Shropshire Council. So um, my uh, report is the Healthy, Healthy Lives update um, and Healthy Lives is a partnership programme of the Health and Wellbeing Board. And in this report, um, I, I'm, I've just done a brief update on social prescribing a bid that's gone into the Local Government Association Stroke Health Foundation and re the Refreshed Healthy Lives Governance Structure. So I've got the background in my report Healthy Lives, which I won't go through. Um, just to quickly go through social prescribing, as I said, this is a brief update and it's proposed that a full update will come to the January meeting 2021. So just to report that it's progressing well, albeit in a different way with telephone rather than face to face consultations during COVID. And as we know, um, a lot of group activities are either closed or operating differently, um, but the advice are managing this well um, and clients are still being referred. So there have been 1022 referrals to date, social prescribing and all, all areas um, that have social prescribing are showing an increase in referral numbers. And I suppose these aren't a surprise. A lot of the, the main re re um, reasons for opportunistic, if I forget words out, referrals, which are mental health difficulties, risk of loneliness and social isolation and long term conditions and lifestyle risk factors. And especially with COVID at the moment, and, and we know that's having um, a big impact on a lot of people's mental health. Again, that isn't really a surprise. Um, GP practices at the moment are focusing on opportunistic referrals. Um, so uh, it is going well and we're seeing an increasing number in the younger age groups, so the 20 to uh, 39s, um, but which is great. It's not, it was a there was originally tended to be older people referrals. Um, but now it is spreading across and we have a lot more GP practices involved. Um, the uh, young people's social prescribing work is progressing and again we'll be able to give an update on that in the meeting at January and um, collaborative work continues uh, with primary care networks and we have 22, 22 GP practices involved. So just some other updates that aren't in the report that I wanted to add. Um, the King's Fund, who are an independent chari charitable organisation uh, working to improve health and care in England, um, have cited Shropshire Social Prescribing in their in their um, one of their reports, which they call an explainer. It's a publication, and what they've put in there is the um, social 
Trump's prescribing evaluation report, which Joe Robbins reported on um, at a meeting probably earlier this year, or it might have been at the end of last year. Uh, but that report is on there, so we're really pleased that um, Shropshire is getting national recognition. Um, and I'll put the link to the report um, in a minute so Michelle can have that, so you can see that if they wish. And also in, uh, with the libraries, um, Shropshire is one of three councils invited by the LGA, that's the Local Government Association, to take part in uh, the webinar Libraries and Public Health, and that's on the 23rd of November. Um, and Lee, who's our portfolio holder for social prescribing, and Michael Lewis, the library services manager, are going to be on a panel to explain social pres prescribing initiatives in Shropshire libraries and the target audience is councillors, that is elected members as councillors. So that is, again, some really good news. And I think, you know, Shropshire is, is definitely being recognised, the work we're doing, which is which is right, because there's so much work going into social prescribing. It's, it's fantastic, the work that's happening there. Um, the next uh, item of report is about the uh, LGA, Local Government Association Health Foundation bid. We've put our bid in for, uh, for the second stage of that bid and um, we, we remain hopeful. It's a really tight time scale and huge thanks to everybody that helped pull this together because it really was a, with, with pressures of COVID that everybody has at the moment. Um, it, it was a really, really good effort. So if we're successful, we get £20,000 uh, and bespoke support from the LGA and the Health Foundation to do what we call this discovery phase. That's what they call it. And that's basically the objectives that we've put forward. They will give us support to do that and, and put that into place. And finally, the updated reporting structure. I've just put um, the updated structure in there. Um, really just to uh, reflect that the change in names of boards, um, the change, cha the agreed priorities that we have from the workshop at the end, I can't believe it was nearly a year ago, December last year. Um, and, and this is just really um, to, as part of governance to, uh, to show uh, how that now looks. Um, the reporting hasn't changed, it's still go, we still report um, from the steering group up to the Health and Wellbeing Board, which is what I'm doing through this report here. We haven't been able to have the Healthy Lives meetings as we would usually, which are monthly, but we will be starting properly in, in the new year. Again, it, it's, it's been that um, Covid uh, response that, that everybody uh, has had to be involved with. Um, so that's it. Thank you very much, Chair. That, concludes my uh, update. Thank you Val, uh, that's very helpful yeah. and yeah I will look in the chat uh, for comments and questions from um, members of the board but I do um, appreciate the update. Yes I think um, since the um, since the government um, since the long-term plan was published um, uh, and social prescribing became part of that and the funding that was provided through the primary care networks for social prescribing, um, we really have seen things move on at pace with social prescribing, and it really is um, encouraging that um, the the early work that we did in Shropshire with our own Shropshire model um, really has paid dividends, so that we we really have hit the ground running and managed to get um, fantastic um, uh, buy-in and partnership working with um, uh, with our um, GP practices across Shropshire. Um, no, I haven't got um, any other speakers coming in, so I appreciate the update. Val, we'll, um, we'll, we'll look forward to um, your January update with some more of the, the news and um, I'll take us back to the uh, agenda item. Um, oh, actually, to be fair, um, uh, we are asked to accept the report um, with to the um to the health and wellbeing board which um i'm happy to uh to do thank you val for that um item eight on the agenda now if we could revert to that um is work on the development of shropshire's weight management strategy um i'm glad i'm standing up for this meeting and keeping active and not sitting down um so um uh one of our consultants in public health, Bernie Lee, is going to be taking this paper. Um, if Bernie's here, let's hope the tech is holding up. Perhaps you'd like to introduce yourself and present the item, please. Hello, uh, can you hear me? 
We can hear you, Bernie. Yes. Excellent. Thank you so much. So my name's Bernie Lee, a consultant in public health with Shropshire Council. This is my first opportunity to meet the Health and Wellbeing Board, uh, which I've looked forward to. And I just hope I don't encounter any technical issues. I apologise now, I won't turn my camera on because when I tried earlier, it, I crashed out. So I don't want that to happen again. That's uh, no problem. Uh, members thanks. of the public don't see the pictures in any case. So the members of the public see what's on the screen. So um, you, you, there's no need for you to use your camera. That's absolutely fine. Lovely, thank you. OK, so uh, so the paper provided for this meeting sets out the could I have my first slide, please. Sorry. Yes. OK, so uh, it's, no, so the paper sets out the context within which uh, the weight management strategy is going to be developed. Um, and, you know, reducing obesity is a priority for both the Health and Wellbeing Board and the STP. And the paper includes details of the work undertaken to date to enable development of the strategy. Um, as the board will be aware, obesity is like an extremely complex societal problem that carries significant consequences in terms of ill health uh, associated with diabetes, heart disease, poor mental health and, and some cancers and life expectancy is reduced on average by about nine years. Uh, further to that, obesity you know, impacts on the lives and to, uh, to an extent the livelihoods of individuals and costs billions uh, of pounds to the wider economy. Uh, obesity and in particular here childhood obesity impacts more on deprived communities so it also presents as a big health inequalities issue. Now there is kind of absolutely no simple solution to the problem. There are multi a multitude of uh, interrelated factors that determine whether a person is susceptible to obesity, genetics plays a role, lifestyle behaviours, uh, related to activity, uh, uh, diet, etc. Habits that are created from infancy and, and childhood and, and are very hard to change. Uh, but I'd say most importantly, it is the environment in which we live that has driven the increase in obesity over recent decades. So I suppose as a species, we've always had a, a, a genetic predisposition to obesity, but uh, 50 years ago, we didn't have an environment that fostered obesity. Back then, we were not surrounded by the fast food takeaways and energy dense food that surrounds us now. And, and our lives were much more active. Uh, physical activity was a necessity in daily life to a greater extent than it is now. Um, I'm, I'm not aware of any evidence that people are less have any less willpower now than they used to, but there is masses of evidence illustrating how our environment has changed. Um, so uh, given the scale of the problem, if you like, and which I'll come to in a second, there are national strategies and plans aimed at reducing obesity and the most they're listed there, but the most recent um, of these is the July uh, strategy, which came out largely in response to the fact that those with COVID who were also obese had particularly poor outcomes. So these national strategies really obviously indicate national action is required, but we also need to try to do far more on a local footprint as well. So um, a sort of other important local context, which has been alluded to uh, at the outset of the meeting, includes the recent decommissioning of weight management services. And there also needs to be recognition of the interface between uh, weight management and, and other work programmes uh, like diabetes prevention and social prescribing, which we've also uh, just mentioned. Uh, so services and support are are, are clearly important, but it's also vital we do more to prevent obesity in the first place. And to that end, Public Health England recommend a whole system approach to obesity. And I, I'll describe a little bit more about that later. But I thought first, if we just look at some of the data uh, taken from the report. So if we have the next slide, please. So uh, this uh, national data indicates that we have in the region of 190,000 adults who are either overweight or obese. 
uh, or, you know, so therefore at risk of obesity, the overweight. And in addition to that, almost 17,000 children and young people. So overall, this is a, over 207,000 people who have excess weight, if you like, within their population. This and is the population, this is population of Shropshire, isn't it? This is Shropshire's population. Yes, sorry, I should have stressed that. Yes, Shropshire's population. So you can see in the table how the number uh, of overweight and obese changes there. We've got reception year and then year six. And you can see uh, an almost doubling of the proportion of obese children between those year groups. And then we've also got some local maternity service data here. Uh, and that shows that almost a quarter of the women are obese at the outset of their pregnancy. than others and the dark areas on uh, this map show where the higher numbers are, of people who are obese are so it's just to show you that um, uh, next slide please now this slide shows how weight among children varies by socio-economic deprivation uh, so the blue portion of the bar represents the proportion of children who are overweight and the orange portion, the percent who are obese. And on the left hand side is the most deprived decile and on the right, the least deprived decile. So you can see that 25% of our most deprived reception children are an unhealthy weight compared to 18% of the least deprived children. Now, childhood obesity is a really big concern for many, many reasons, but it includes the fact that the longer a person is obese, the more likely they are to have complications such as diabetes. And type two, type two di diabetes used to be a disease of adulthood only, but it's now increasing in prevalence among adolescents. So, you know, clearly the sooner we act, the sooner we get in there, the, the better uh, the longer term outcomes. So I'll now, uh, I think at that point, move on to the work we have started. So if I have my next slide, please. Um, so I'm at this point, I'm just going to go to the, the bullet point which says areas of focus. So uh, I'll start with these and um, these are the areas that we've identified that we need to you know, uh, sort of themes that we need to develop through our strategy. And uh, whilst there are uh, like multiple causes of obesity and, and contributing factors, top of the list must be, I think, the food environment. D too much access to really unhealthy food and uh, the significant issue of food poverty, which I know this board has previously received reports on. I mean, the issue of food poverty links to that inequality that we saw in the obesity among children, because families on low income needing to feed their children, uh, you know, they need to fill them up with something and they turn to filling stodgy, unhealthy foods so they stave off hunger. But this, of course, then these foods predispose to obesity. So that's a really important area. Then there is the built environment and how this enables or limits opportunities for physical activity. Uh, uh, we also need to be uh, working with all of our frontline staff, the NHS, the council, other public sector, other employers, so that can be helped to get the support uh, to, to achieve a healthy weight through what um, is available. And we, you know, we really need to have a hard look at prevention across the life course. Um, a chief medical officer report published last year indicated that up to 25% of 18 month, 
18 month olds uh, were heading uh, towards an unhealthy weight. And so I think this really reinforces the need uh, to, to really be starting early. That was a national uh, statistic, not a local one. Um, so in the context of all this, we need to determine where are the gaps in support for people um, who need and want it. So then it sort of makes sense really to go to the top of the slide there with the whole system uh, approach, because given the complexity of the challenge and the fact that there is no easy solution, we need to uh, sort of address the problem through taking a whole system approach. And a, a whole system approach recognises that there are lots of different elements at play that need to be addressed in order to, to create positive change. Um, we need to sort of dig into the root causes of problems, understand how issues at a local level are connected to each other and then sort of find opportunities to change things, uh, you know, opportunities to change things and we're, I suppose work together to bring that improvement. Uh, and the detailed stages of this whole system approach are included in Appendix 1 to the report. Uh, so again, and then looking at, you know, that there is national evidence around how do you really make these whole system approaches work? Uh, and uh, national indica it, evidence indicates we really need uh, sort of strong strategic support for this approach and that success depends on really good engagement with our communities, uh, taking place based approaches, because what obviously what works in Ludlow will be different to say what works in 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 Oswestry and, and so on. Uh, so next slide, please. So uh, sort of to press on with our work, uh, we need to establish our engagement process and a proposed approach to that is set out in detail in Appendix 2. And obviously uh, the engagement needs to be COVID safe. Uh, and so it's proposed that we use a combination of uh, surveys, uh, podcasts and, and Zoom meetings together with face to face discussions where they are safe to do so. And hopefully over the life of the development of the strategy, we might move into a full capability for face to face discussions, which would be great. Um, I must say I've been quite pleasantly surprised by the enthusiasm that this approach has received uh, from colleagues and, par uh, and partners because, uh, you know, I I've shared it uh, with others and uh, suggestions have been made and incorporated into the proposed approach. So that uh, sort of bodes quite well. Um, and I think it would be really great to get as wide a reach as possible with the survey, sort of involving NHS Council, and, and staffing other organisations as well as community groups and, and, and through those community groups, individuals living in different parts of Shropshire. Um, this engagement is an important next step, but uh, before we embark on the process, I think it would be ideally, you know, we'd like to convene a single, if you like, multi-agency group to make a sort of, uh, make sure our approach is comprehensive and connected to other relevant development and opportunities. I think this would have been an obvious place to start, uh, you know, to convene such a group, but given the significant capacity constraints that all of our uh, sort of uh, parts of our system and services are operating under, uh, that hasn't happened as yet. Uh, over time, we'll obviously uh, the next steps will involve reviewing the evidence in relation to the areas or themes that we're focusing on. So the food environment, physical activity, prevention, those areas that I listed earlier. And through all of this, we'll come together to create a strategy that will be informed through the engagement and then the dialogue that we have with communities, because um, Ultimately, we'll need to intervene to improve the prevention of obesity, starting with maternal health and infant feeding, uh, obviously intervening early and uh, supporting school aged children and, and supporting adults. Uh, but if, if we create a healthier environment across Shropshire, particularly for our communities 
with the greatest challenges, then I think we'll improve the prospects of a healthy weight across all uh, population groups in, in Shropshire. So I guess I would sort of basically just say we, we really need to try get to the point where we're making the healthy choice uh, the easy choice. And I think at that point, I, I would I'll stop for any questions. Thank you, Bernie. Thank you, Bernie. Really, really, really interesting, interesting paper. paper and, um, and, um, as you say, a you significant, say a significant challenge, challenge to the system. <laughs> um, um, I've, got I've got Jackie, Jackie Jeffrey, Jeffrey wants, wants, to wants to come in. If you could introduce yourself first, Jackie. Hi, yeah, yeah. Oh, I've got a bit of an echo. Uh, Jackie Jeffrey, um, I'm the Volunteer Sector Assembly Rep. Um, I'm also sits. I also sit on the social task force and chair of the hardship and poverty um, subcommittee. Um, so I don't want to bang on the drum again because I mentioned it at the last meeting, and I know there's work going on in the background about, you know, poverty and hardship and food poverty. Um, uh, you know, it's not just about a healthy choice; it's an easy choice because people who live long term on low income. And all the new people coming into this vulnerable group because of the impact of COVID, it's not just a matter of um, uh, you know about an easy choice about understanding nutrition, um, and you know you mentioned about food poverty as well. So please, can I just implore? There's lots of work going on about food poverty and understanding about how people on low income or are on um, temporary housing and can't feed themselves healthily because they don't have those facilities, how council tax support um, also impacts on people's ability to eat healthily and afford nutritious food. It is a complex and nuanced situation. So any conference or any multi agency working has to tie into the social task force work because we're recommending the same thing. Um, and um, let's just get this right um, uh, across policy um, and across multi agency working. It's so important going into the next few months of some serious serious situations for people in Shropshire. Can Thank I you. just Thank you, Jackie. Is it appropriate Bernie. to say anything? Yes, I mean, I just want to say uh, to Jackie that I agree with every word she has said. And from the outset of this work, one of the first uh, contacts I made was with Emily Fay from the Food Poverty Alliance. And I am going to be working hand in glove with her moving forward is my desire. Thank you, Bernie. And if you want um, an introduction to the um, COVID social task force, then um, it's uh, it's a group that I chair. I hasten to add um, I, I do very little work, but I do coordinate the uh, <laughs> the agenda and encourage colleagues who are working very hard, um, but happy to get in touch and refer you through to that if appropriate. Um, so thank you, Jackie, for that. Um, I've got a couple of speakers lined up. So um, Zafa, if you could introduce yourself, um, go ahead. Uh, I'm uh, Zafar Iqbal, I'm an Associate Medical Di Director at uh, MPFT, but my background is public health, but uh, really pleased to see this paper and uh, fully support the prevention agenda and the intervening early. I think that's excellent. I think that's the way to go. Um, just a comment about supporting adults. I mean, the kind of numbers are so huge in terms of numbers of adults who are obese that it'd be virtually impossible to, it would take you decades, centuries to be able to offer support to, to you know, to be able to, for adults to be able to, you know, lose uh, lose lose weight sufficiently. Um, just a couple of things are on there. One is that uh, I think it is, uh, uh, worth providing intensive support for those people who are at very high risk. So those people with existing uh, cardiovascular disease or diabetes, etc. Or and the uh, and the other group I think we miss out in the high risk risk group is those people with mental illness and especially serious mental illness. Uh, they they have very very poor life expectancy. Um, the second thing I'd just like to raise is that for the general population who are, you know, keen to lose weight, uh, we've just done a review of uh, digital apps, the effectiveness of these digital apps for improving healthy lifestyles, and, and they're not too bad. They're certainly getting a lot better as time goes by. 
and uh, that might be worth looking at. I can send you the the, the paper if that's of uh, any help. Thank you, Zafar. That sounds like it would be very helpful. Um, I've got a couple more um, speakers want to come in. We'll take those first, Bernie, and then you can come back. Um, so Julian wanted to come in. If you could just introduce yourself, Julian. Hi, so I'm Julian Povey. I'm chair of Shropshire CCG. I wanted just to really welcome this paper. Um, with my two hats on, is it from the CCG's point of view, we obviously clearly welcome this and are going to be part of uh, um, working with the council on, on developing the, the plan. Um, and we'll obviously help promote the surveys and podcast and engagement processes um, as and when, when needed. Um, as a local GP, you know, the loss of help to slim and help to quit the anti-smoking services has been a huge blow in the services that we have and the tools that we can use to sort of um, provide patients with to help them sort of uh, improve their health and well-being. So, uh, you know, we I very much welcome this review and the idea of doing the gap analysis to see what is uh, what, what's needed out there to help support people and particularly you know, building on Zafra's comments, you know, we've got to use the digital methods, haven't we, and, and you know, embrace the technology. Thank you, Julian. Um, Rachel would like to come in. Rachel, do you want to introduce yourself? Yes, so Rachel Robinson, Director of Public Health, and I think it's probably, for me, it was just to kind of, I suppose, summarise some of this from my point of view. I mean, thanks, thank you to Bernie for, for bringing forward the paper. Obviously, um, this is a commitment that... Okay, that's sorted, thank you. Um, a commitment that was made um, some some last year before that, last year when we agreed as a board that this would be a priority on STP, but also prior to that, when, and when I first came into post and we agreed that we would look again, um, as Julian's mentioned, you know, not to shy away from it, the decommissioning of the services, we needed to look again at this. And I think what Bernie's presented is that it is that system's very complex approach that we don't just focus on one area. Um, in order to, ta to tackle and um, reduce obesity, we look at the whole area, which I think Bernie's presented and absolutely joining up all the work that's already there, all the work that's going on and bringing that together is absolutely key to this ambition. Part of that is looking at, at services. We did and I did make a commitment to look at that, um, to look at segmenting, to look at new technology, to look at the evidence base around that. So just to confirm that that, that is part of, of what we're looking at, but it is that wider whole systems approach. Um, that we've got so much opportunity around in Shropshire and on the back of COVID when we when we look at the environment that we're in. Um, and so really, um, my ambition would have been that this would have been completed much sooner, but obviously a little thing called COVID has got in the way um, and certainly um, taken away some of the capacity that we would have used around this. So I just wanted to kind of say that publicly, I think, and to thank Bernie for taking this forward for, for us. Thank you. Thanks, Rachel. That was very helpful. Um, and thank you to Bernie for presenting um, a really interesting and um, important paper for the board. Um, I have not got any other speakers indicating. Um, so unless anyone makes any comments in the box, um, the proposal here and the recommendation is that we um, accept the recommendations in the um, Shropshire's weight management strategy paper and um, I'm happy to recommend to the board that we accept those if everyone's happy with that. Yep. OK, that's fantastic. Thank you, uh, colleagues, for that. Um, moving on to agenda item nine. Um, uh, really, really interesting um, paper and uh, one that I think really draws together uh, quite a lot of the strands that we've been talking about today. Um, so this is harnessing COVID-19 support across Shropshire and um, I'm pleased to introduce uh, Julia Barron. If you could just introduce yourself, Julia, and take us through the report. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everybody. My name is Julia Barron. I'm the Chief Executive of Shropshire Rural Communities Charity. Um, the purpose of our charity, we've been going for 60 years, um, is to improve the quality of life for people in Shropshire, but particularly to support those people who are particularly disadvantaged by living in a rural area. And our, our purpose um, over 60 years hasn't really changed. Uh, we've done lots of different project work to respond to those particular disadvantages, but the, the core of our organisation is exactly the same. So. COVID and the community response to it um, was right bang in the middle of our arena. It was it was a really key um, area for us to be working in. 
And as I'm sure everybody will appreciate, it was a catalyst for a great deal of uh, community goodwill and activity. Um, lots of people wanted to step up to help their neighbours. There was a huge amount of um, generosity, I think, is probably the best way of, of um, explaining that. Um, so we were very concerned about, um, first of all, harnessing that, but also um, to, to consolidate it, I suppose, to make sure that what was being generated by what is in effect a crisis uh, was, was not going to be lost when things settled down a bit. So we did a survey. Um, we estimated that there was around 120 groups in Shropshire that had sprung up or had been um, doing something previously in Shropshire, but had changed what they did to deliver their services in a different way. And so we, the survey really was to find out what had people been doing, uh, what issues had they faced, whether they intended to continue, and if they did intend to continue, what support they might need, um, particularly from organisations like ourselves. And it was really, we had a really good response actually. We had about 68 uh, responses from different groups of, around the county. Uh, and. It, what they told us was very interesting. I hope people have read the report. It's quite a long report with a lot of detail and we've left everything in there in terms of the way that people have um, given their responses. We haven't edited it in any way. So um, some of the, the responses are a little bit raw, um, but I, you know, I think it, I, it does make very interesting reading. Um, I think the thing that we I'd like to really draw attention to is is what the report tells us and about how things might um, go forward. And and this this is really a fleshing out of the recommendations in the uh, the cover sheet that you've had. So um, first of all, that groups do need to grow organically and that they don't want to be organised or controlled or directed by statutory organisations and particularly not who they should be helping and how they should be helping them. But having said that, being part of a locally organised group really does matter. The support from other local people, making connections, making friends, these are all the benefits that actually motivate the volunteers. They want to be part of something. And unlike um, some of the apps that were set up, Good Sam I think was one of them, but there was a, there was a few set up by other organisations or the government didn't really work. They worked in the sense that people stepped forward, but I heard and saw lots of disappointed people who had put themselves forward, said that they wanted to help, um, but then weren't used. I think they were used in much more urban areas, but were not necessarily used in um, rural areas or in particular in Shropshire. Those kinds of calls to action can motivate large groups of crisis volunteers. But it isn't sustainable. You know, people can be called on to to do something, you know, whether it's, I don't know, collect large amounts of food and distribute it, but it's a one off um, activity. It needs something else behind it um, for people to continue to volunteer. Uh, also, um, I would say that groups work better when they have a modest number of volunteers. People in, in rural villages, they don't want 400 volunteers all stepping up. There isn't enough for those people to do. It's better to have a smaller number who've got meaningful tasks and can build relationships with individual people that they're supporting. And But at the same time, they need enough to keep them motivated, but not so much to do that it overwhelms them because then you get burnout. And we are already seeing a little bit of volunteer fatigue where people they stepped up in the crisis and were willing to help, but they didn't sign up for this for life. So there needs to be a flow through of, of different kinds of volunteers. Also, um, locally organised groups can be very agile in responding to change, whereas if they are organised by statutory organisations, they have certain ways that they, they need to work and um, you know, reporting back that they need to make, and that doesn't necessarily um, fit with the way that things change on the ground. The second point um, was about safe operating. Um, groups want to be operating safely and the community needs them to operate safely. With the nature of this particular pandemic, everything happened so quickly, it was difficult to put checks in place due to the rapid setup. So as an organisation, one of the things that we did alongside the, the local authority was to put 
um, recommended safeguards in place, uh, particularly through uh, the parish councils, so that people were not handling other people's money. That was the biggest anxiety that we had. You know, what we didn't want was people saying, go and get my shopping, here's £50. Pounds. Um, and then the person that they gave the money to disappearing off into the sunset. So we we helped organisations to put all sorts of mechanisms in place. Um, in some cases, it was working with local shops to um, for people to be able to pay over the phone. And then the volunteer was just collecting the shopping, um, but also um, being able to make payments through a, um, a trusted account and the volunteers being reimbursed. Um, and the, the people who had the shopping bought uh, to, to repay the parish council or whatever organisation it was. There were also other issues around safety, around um, was it OK to go into people's houses and put the shopping away? I mean, that's obviously not ideal. But if you are somebody, a caring person in the community, and you can see that by dropping three bags of shopping at the door of somebody who's quite frail, who's come to the door with a walking stick or a walking frame, it's, you know, it would be very harsh for people not to take that shopping in and put it away for them. But obviously, you know, there are lots of potential for uh, people being scammed or being put at risk. So groups need to know what what's appropriate for them to do, what protocols can they put in place, what procedures can they have to make sure that both the people that they're supporting and the volunteers who are supporting them are not put at any kind of risk. Um, the third thing is about money. Um, most of the groups were oper operating on very tiny budgets, um, you know, maybe £500 from the local authority. Um, maybe they got some local support from other organisations. This really just covers the basics. There were a number of um, comments about volunteers who had been driving to the shops in their cars, um, but not had any reimbursement for their mileage. And that's fine for a couple of weeks. But that can't continue indefinitely. And in order to keep uh, volunteers, uh, there needs to be some mechanism to enable them to be able to recover their direct costs, even if they're not earning anything from it. And then finally, um, the, the support that groups need needs to come from trusted advisors. And that might be ourselves. It might be other organisations in the voluntary sector. It might be the local authority. But this does cost money. It's not something that comes for free. And it's it's the hardest thing to raise money for in that um, whether it's um, statutory funders or whether it's charitable trusts or the lottery or whatever, people always want to see that the direct beneficiaries are the ones that are getting the money. So the infrastructure support to enable those organisations to be able to to benefit their beneficiaries um, are not necessarily the ones that will get the funding. We've been lucky. We've managed to get some funding from the lottery um, to uh, to support this in the short term. It will only last until March. And we've had a really good response from groups who want um, quite small scale training just to, to, for them to feel that they are informed and understand what their responsibilities and uh, possibilities are. Um, some help with fundraising training, some help with um, mentoring from people who are much more experienced and can and guide you know new organizations through the process and also some help with dbs checking for volunteers not all volunteers will need to be dbs checked but those who are having um handling money and having relationships direct relationships with people perhaps through driving or befriending they do need uh, dbs checks so um I think that's really all I wanted to say. Um, I don't know if anybody would have any questions or if anybody would like to make any comments. Thank you, Thank you. Um, Julia. Julia. Got a strange got a echo, echo on my, echo line. my line. Perhaps you could just mute yourself, Julia, and Julia wait until we get questions get to come back. OK. That solved it. Perfect. Um, Really, really interesting paper, really important to understand um, not just um, the sustainability of those newly established groups, but also any work that enables us to support the resilience of uh, the community and voluntary sector, I think is really um, vital. And you'll be aware that the um, COVID social task force um, is looking very specifically, we've got a um, task and finish group looking at uh, community and voluntary sector infrastructure 
um, and how as uh, partner organisations, including the council, um, we seek to support and understand how we best build and strengthen that infrastructure. And it, it, it's absolutely um, uh, at the core of, uh, of what you're talking about. So often um, uh, funding for community and voluntary organisations has been based on outputs and outcomes of a particular task. But uh, quite a few of the small grant schemes that in the past enabled those organisations to support their infrastructure um, have um, uh, been withdrawn or been replaced with um, different funding mechanisms. And it's 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 that it's that and the fact that we know because of um, uh, the pandemic, the um, the ability for these organisations to sustain themselves, whether it's from um, uh, not being able to fundraise in quite the same way that they have before. Um, a, a lot of their volunteers, particularly locally myself, I know that um, uh, Mayfair Community Centre in Church Stratton, uh, uh, certainly in the first wave of the pandemic, saw um, very significant um, proportions of their volunteer base um, being asked to self-isolate and to, um, to, to, um, to stay at home and um, to stay safe, quite rightly. Uh, but obviously that has significant implications for um, for the organisations. Um, I um, I'm looking down to see um, any comments from any other speakers or anyone else coming in. I can't I can't see any more. Um, I know that um, you've made a number of recommendations in your report. Um, our recommendation is um, to uh, to note the comments um, on the report. Um, Julian, I think, would like to come in. Julian, if you'd like to introduce yourself. Yes, yeah, it's Julian Povey, Chair of Shropshire CCG and a GP in Pompsbury. I just wanted to um, you know, welcome again, welcome this report you know, and say that although I don't think the Pompsbury group replied, certainly, you know, in my um, half time job as a GP in Pompsbury, you know, it was a huge support having the sort of volunteer network that um, that was in Pompsbury and they've been very helpful both in sort of uh, direct ways, you know, getting um, prescriptions to patients uh, directly that help the surgery and help patients and also but the wider support around the food bank and through the sort of uh, befriending and buddying. So um, I think the, you know, it's been a huge sort of um, kickstart to that sort of social change. We've always, well, for a number of years, had a compassionate communities group, which was established to work with the CCG and the hospice and then have a, a sort of a social prescriber and, you know, it's sort of uh, pushed it into another sort of level really during COVID and uh, hopefully we'll be able to maintain that and also hopefully there's a lot of learning so that it's something that um, doesn't um, increase inequalities and so that it's something that you know as the CCG and as a council and as the you know rural um, council you know we can um, you know we can actually push this across the whole of our society because I do worry that it might be uh, more available in places where there's um, a more able community, a community that's able to help. So other areas may struggle. So I'd welcome any thoughts about how we can make sure that everyone's got access to this sort of increased sort of uh, um, social activation, and social involvement in sort of health and social care. Thanks, Julian. Uh, Julia, did you want to come back? Uh, yeah, I just wanted to say, I mean, in Pontsbury, it's very interesting that we've been working with um, Debbie, the the Parish Clerk um, to actually set up a good neighbours scheme which will cover Pontsbury and some of the surrounding areas and that's actually a really good outcome from um, some of the I mean th that was in play before this but I think the Covid situation sort of accelerated it a bit um, and it's it's really interesting to see what's happening there and we're, we're going to be supporting Debbie to try and get some real uh, finance to actually um, support you know, a, a proper, a really sort of robust scheme with a coordinator, a paid coordinator. And you're absolutely right. I suppose my concern has always been that there are some people who will fall through the net because of where they live and because the the rural areas are not all the same by any means. There are some really tiny communities, no more than hamlets. And and if, uh, in fact, where I live, when the um, the, the pandemic started, um, there was a map that was put up by Shropshire Council of all the groups that were known that were supporting people um, and where I live I just happened to look just to, out of curiosity and 
my nearest group was about six miles away. So, um, you know, my husband actually falls into the uh, the shielded group. Obviously, I'm still working and I've been able to, to support him. But if I wasn't around, I wasn't sure that he would have been able to access the support that, that he might have needed. So I think that's a an interesting thing to, to remember and uh, something that we do need to work on. The other thing I just wanted to say, Lee, was um, you mentioned Mayfair Community Centre. Um, and I think the other interesting thing that's happened is that um, because they were struggling with their existing volunteers, they did quite a big recruitment drive at Mayfair to try and encourage younger people to come forward and volunteer. And not only did they get a really good response to that, but those younger volunteers have been motivated to stay in touch with Mayfair and to continue. And I think that's another the thing about Mayfair obviously is it's a very strong local organisation. It's got lots of policies and procedures in place. It looks after its volunteers very well. And so they they have been able to support those volunteers to want to stay, but that's not necessarily the case everywhere. And, and that is one of the reasons why it's so important for us to be doing this work. Absolutely, Julia, and I, um, uh, I agree. Um, we, we, you know, Mayfair is a very long established um, uh, organisation with deep roots in the community, and um, some of these organisations are literally starting up on that journey. And so um, understanding what, um, what the ingredients for success are, as much as what are the challenges that are going to prevent the organisations remaining sustainable is uh, is absolutely crucial. So thank you for um, the the paper and the work that you continue to do. Um, I haven't got any more. Uh, oh, I beg your pardon. Um, Rachel Robinson would like to comment. Rachel. Thanks, uh, Rachel Robinson, Director of Public Health. Um, it was just again, um, just to say thank you very much for this paper and, and, and thank you for everything that everybody is doing, as you've said. Um, the 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 way that people have worked and that all of our huge kind of volunteers and our communities across Shropshire make it so very unique and we would not be where we are and um, prior to COVID but especially in COVID without all of this and I, I recognise exactly what you were saying around that kind of ex exhaustion and the the issues that we've got particularly going into winter um, and then coming out of this how we need to learn and build on all of this um, there was so much work that we've talked about previously um, and as part of our kind of strategies we've talked about as a board and we've also talked about in our groups around the community Community, how we create a health and well-being environment because it's the community work that everybody does is so absolutely important to that and I think that's what helps keep Shropshire so comparatively healthy to other areas and has helped us through certainly through the pandemic it's shown forward so I think it's how we continue we need to be working more you know we continue and we have been working very closely with you our community reassurance teams and and all of our other teams that's been mentioned in the other papers but just um to kind of recognize that and to say we must you know we must and we need to continue to work with you closely going forward um, and to support you uh, because we couldn't do it without the community. So it's just a kind of recognition of that, I think. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel. Um, I um, I note that the, um, uh, the recommendation is that we note the contents of the report. Um, I'm happy to propose that. Um, could I have a um, seconder for that proposal? I'm happy to second. Yeah, Lee. thank you, Rachel. Yeah, that's excellent. And um, I, unless I see any comments to the contrary in the chat feature, which I haven't, I'm very pleased to say that um, the board will accept that recommendation and note the contents. And thank you, for you and your colleagues, for the work you continue to uh, to do. Thank you, Julia. Um, Item 10 on the agenda is a COVID-19 update, which we did briefly reference um, earlier when we were talking about unpredictability as we go into winter. But also um, I'm pleased that uh, we're also going to be having an update on flu immunisations on this paper. So item 10 um, is over to you, Rachel, if you could take us through this, please. Thank you. Um, so just the, as I said, some of this has already been covered in previous papers, but really what I wanted to do here was just give a, a summary on where we are in terms of our COVID um, figures and update and then just very briefly to touch on, on flu as well, as if I may. Um, so in terms of COVID, there is some numbers in the paper, but I'm just going to give you, as you can imagine, this changes uh, very rapidly and on a daily basis. So I just wanted to give you a few headlines for where we are in Shropshire at the moment. 
Um, so in the last week, we have seen 690 cases across Shropshire. And um, that's obviously a significant increase since we last met as a board. Our rate is now, um, as of uh, this is two days ago, at 213.5, and that's a 20% increase on the previous week. Um, the rate that we also want to look at and focus on is particularly what's happening in our over 60s. That's really important. And our rate in our over 60s is 155. That's an increase of 6% uh, over last week, which is just one a slight slowing on the week before. However, the fact that um, knowing that we've got 57% of our population in Shropshire who are vulnerable, it's really important that we keep an eye on our rate, particularly um, as an indicator in our over 60s and vulnerable groups, because that there has an impact on both our um, health capacity and social care capacity, and then obviously on um, more morbidity and mortality rates in terms of deaths. Um, and Rachel, so, Rachel, yes. sorry, could I just could I just stop you there? Um, yeah. Could you just go through? Uh, you, you you have a tendency, and um, I, I, you always have, of speaking extremely fast. Oh yeah. Um, just um, you just to clarify, because um, the it, it's a um, uh, public meeting. Um, you said 290 cases last week. Um, oh. The rate per hundred thousand of the Shropshire population is at 213. Is that two one three? Yes, it is. Sorry. And it's sorry, and it's, 600, it's 690 cases. Yeah, 690 cases. And then the over, did you say the over 65s rate is 155? It is, yes, currently. OK, and that's per 100,000 of Shropshire population. It is, yeah. OK, um, yeah, thank no. you. Sorry for that clarity. It's just that no, no. Uh, you, <laughs> you race through yeah. those. You race through those three key measures. And I just wanted to make sure that um, the public listening could um, could could hear those. No, and they will. We will update these. We do update these regularly. Um, obviously, the figures do change as we get more results through. On average, we've been getting just over 100, as you can see, about 120 cases in a day. But our numbers are increasing. We do expect our numbers to increase before we then start to see the impact of lockdown, which has usually got a, about a seven to 10 day delay before you start to see that impact on cases, that is. Um, in terms of hospital admissions and deaths, there's obviously a lag in terms of our cases rising and then hospital admissions and then deaths. Um, and so it will take it will take several weeks before we see the impact on our hospital reduction in those rates coming down or indeed on our deaths. Um, as I said, within Shropshire, um, we are, cons we are al although we are generally above average in terms of health in the population for COVID because of the vulnerability of our population, we need to keep a very close eye on, on our figures and our, um, because COVID, as we know, impacts on the most vulnerable. The other issue to raise across Shropshire is that whilst in the first wave, um, I think the, the understanding was that we did see we had seen cases in, particularly in, in hospital settings because of the, the way that that was tested at that time. Um, also linked to care homes and outbreaks in other in workplace and other settings. Certainly now, the, at this point in time, the majority of our cases, the vast majority of our cases are not within workplaces or care home outbreaks. They actually are within kind of households or community transmission. We are seeing widespread community transmission and all of our wards across Shropshire in the last seven days have got cases of COVID in them. So across the county, we have seen um, cases. However, as I've said, we do have lockdown. We are in lockdown now and that will impact on that social spread that we've seen in, in, in particularly within um, household to household. Um, so we'll continue to monitor that. So and so in terms of um, COVID, as we've said, there's an awful lot of work that's going on as we come towards winter. We've um, Dave mentioned vaccines earlier. We are obviously looking at testing um, and we're we are looking at that at this current time. We've got good testing capacity across the county and good availability of testing. Um, and so we're encouraging anybody with symptoms about how mild to go forward and get tested. We have postal tests as well as actually walk in um, a drive in availability of testing. And we are looking at, as you would expect, um, new testing that's coming online. And we're looking at that at the moment. There's, as I said, there's the testing, the vaccine. The other things that will help us move forward over these next few months are the contact tracing. Are people isolating when when they are positive or have any symptoms and that contact tracing and obviously people following the guidelines that are in place and we've described this um, as the kind of Swiss cheese approach that's very well used in health and safety settings where you need all of these different strands in place to prevent and to hold back the spread of the virus. Um, so as I said work continues at pace. There's a whole amount of work that's going on around communications. You'll have seen our Step Up Shropshire campaign. 
we'll be looking at over the next six months where we come out in terms of tiers. So we were we were at tier one when we went in, went into lockdown. That will as we come out, will that will be being looked at nationally. I've mentioned testing and vaccination, and obviously there's a considerable amount of work that continues in our community reassurance teams, our regulations sector, as well as uh, linking into all the structures that are there. As a council um, and as a Shropshire area, we have got our COVID helpline that's in place to support people throughout this. Um, and so I would remind people that that's there and if people have got any concerns about welfare, mental health, um, questions around COVID, they can come through and we will support them at our, through our helpline. Um, obviously, one of the big issues we're also concerned about at the moment is people's mental health as we go into winter particularly, and we've been um, promoting a lot of the work that's going on around mental health, um, and so we've put additional services in place to support people, but obviously working together to get people to get people through this difficult time. Um, but, you know, we have the, there is, um, I'd say there's light at the end of the tunnel, um, and, you know, we, we, we're amazing, as we've already said, community spirit within Shropshire that will get us through this together. We've all got our parts and we will, we will get through this. Um, so that's where we are in terms of COVID. Um, and I will keep, we, we publish regularly, we publish weekly on the website now, the, our figures and our, our data. There are also the government website's been updated. So there's a lot of local area, um, local data that's on the government website that people will be used to. So if I can point people there as well, there's information on cases. Um, testing and deaths on there so please people to keep an eye there but we will we keep you updated um through through many channels and um, social media um but obviously we have to be mindful that not everybody can um, access digital channels or the or the radio and the newspapers so i think some of the networks that we've talked about in terms of our community groups are really really important um just to talk then very briefly about flu um, so you'll know that this year, um, more than any year, it's important that we have to keep people safe and well. And um, flu is a really, really important part of that in terms of keeping people well, but also reducing pressure, um, as we've, as we've talked about, on the wider system. This year, we've got a target to get at least 75 percent of people in the, in the groups that have been identified or in, and are in the paper. 75 of people vac uh, vaccinated um, and additional groups have been added this year. Compared to the same point in last year, it's really pleasing to report that our figures are increased and, and even on the data that was reported in the report that went to Health and Wellbeing Board, updated figures suggest that our numbers have increased from that point. So just as an example, in our over 65s, 64% um, of people have been vaccinated who are eligible at this point in time, had their flu jab. The um, Compared to last year, that was 51%. So some of that is down to um, the, the sort of speed of testing people going through, but also it's really pleasing to see people coming forward. But we would always encourage people, and um, particularly those at risk and, and um, those who are pregnant, to go and get their to go and get their flu jab. Um, the the program is, as you know, it it started with the 65s and it had been um, allocated to the old 50s. All of that would starts to to roll out. So it's really really important, really good news, part of keeping and people healthy and well, as I said, and reducing that pressure. Um, there's others on the call, I'm not sure if Sam's still on the call, but who've been, who are very involved in this as well and may want to comment, but I just, it's just to give that um, summary really on where we are with COVID, where we are with flu, and ask people and remind people to, if they are eligible, go and get their flu vaccine. Um, and just again, with the COVID, to ask people to continue to follow those steps that we all know. Um, and, you know, we will get through this. So that, thank you very much. Thank you, Rachel, for that. And thank you for the incredible work you continue to do. Um, Dean wanted to come in. Thank you, Chairman. Can you hear me? Yes. Excellent. That's a good start. Um, I just wanted to pay tribute to Rachel and all of the public health team and the officers who've been seconded across from other departments and the people of our partner agencies for everything that they've done over the course of um, of this of this pandemic. I know, Chair, that you've seen from an outbreak that that happened in your division the incredible volume of work and support that we've thrown into communities when there's been outbreaks, and that has been it's been nothing short of um, superb the the work that our that our officers have done so i want to pay tribute to to them firstly secondly i want to share a couple of resources with um, fellow members of the board and also for anybody else who may be listening 
the phone number that Rachel referenced, the council's COVID hotline, is 0345 678 9028. And we also have a range of good and useful supportive tools on the website, uh, which is www.shropshire.gov.uk forward slash coronavirus. Um, that's practical support specifically for help with coronavirus and navigating lockdown, but also um, support for people's mental health, which is also a big concern in, in the second national lockdown. So we've got quite a quite quite a good range of support resources there. And we have our community reassurance teams who've been doing fantastic work, as you heard earlier, out very much out in the communities and and trying to reach and engage with the hardest to reach um, and most vulnerable members of our community. So a huge thank you to everybody who's been involved in that. Thank you, Dean, for that. Um, I haven't got any other speakers indicating. Um, so the recommendation on the paper is that we um, accept the report and um, we note the contents of the report. And also, I think it's important that we take the opportunity uh, to promote flu vaccinations for those eligible groups and to make sure that we get well above um, Rachel's magic number of 75%. I think we can definitely do better than that. Um, I'm going to propose that we accept the recommendations. Uh, Dean, are you happy to second that? Yes, yes, thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you. So if I don't see any other indications on the chat, um, I will take that recommendation as accepted by the board. Um, thank you, Rachel, for um, for presenting that paper. So um, we have come to item 11, which is chairman's updates. Um, I've got a couple of updates, but by way of AOB, um, there's a couple of items I think that um, uh, Vanessa would like to cover from a health watch perspective. Um, so, Vanessa, are you available to cover those couple of points that you wanted to bring to the board? Yes, indeed. Thank you very much. Um, the, the first one, um, in fact, if Jackie Jeffries is still with us, um, she's probably better placed to, to talk about it. But um, in the context of sort of available funding for some of the important work over the winter, the NHS Charities Together has offered more than um, £200,000 to be allocated to the voluntary care and hospice sector organisations for supporting NHS patients within Shropshire and Telford. And there's quite a tight um, time frame for bids, which would be submitted by the 11th of December. Um, if Jackie is still here, she might be able to give a bit more detail, but I'm sure that the VCSA could actually do that anyway. But the other thing that I wanted to mention. Oh, here we go. Can I come back on that? Well, I think I think you wanted to update a little around paragraph 88 of the minutes. Um, you were talking about some discussions you're having with safeguarding teams. Safeguarding. Thank you very much. It was simply that um, because of the lack of face to face meetings between pa uh, well patients, the public and professionals, there is concern that um, some of the, the physical signs um, that indicate neglect or other issues um, relating to safeguarding um, might be missed. And um, so we've been having, uh, Health Watch Shropshire has been having discussions with the chair of the safeguarding board as to how we can improve communications um, in this context. Um, but hopefully we can come back to you with, a, with an update on that. Thank you. You're very welcome, Vanessa. Thank you for that. And thank you for um, uh, stepping in today and attending the meeting. That's much appreciated. Um, 
So on item um, 11, then the other updates that I've got from a chairman's perspective, um, I've received four items of correspondence. Um, three of these are from um, NHS England primary care support. Um, one is related, uh, it's dated the 5th of October, and it's, uh, it says that from the 28th of September, the pharmacy at Rouse Hill Shrewsbury, run by JK Lunt, has relocated to the tannery Baker Street Shrewsbury and is now operated by Lunt's Healthcare. Um, the pharmaceutical list for the area of our Health and Wellbeing Board will be amended from that date. And I've then had further letters dated November the 3rd and the 5th relating to the change of ownership application. And this, this is with effect from the 4th of November. The pharmacy at the High Street Highly in Shropshire will be operated by Giles Evans Limited. And just confirmation that the pharmaceutical list for the area of Shropshire Health and Wellbeing Board will be amended from that date. The last item of um, correspondence that I've had um, was from the Royal British Legion. Um, and uh, this relates to concerns of loneliness and social isolation in the armed forces community. And what the Legion is looking for is for local authorities to um, recognise some of those issues and to take that in consideration um, in relation to both our um, uh, joint strategic needs assessment and our health and wellbeing strategies. Now, some of you will be aware that um, in Shropshire we have an armed forces covenant, um, in fact, uh, an award winning armed forces covenant, um, and we have um, a specific officer lead in relation to our armed forces covenant work. And so what we are keen to do, I think, from a health and wellbeing board perspective is to um, to make that connection. So we've contacted the um, the lead, the officer lead. Um, and it's interesting because it ties into a piece of work that the armed forces covenant team are now embarking on relating to some new legislation that's going to be coming forward um, for um, consideration and um, uh, uh, new laws coming in from um, Westminster in relation to uh, duties in respect of um, armed forces personnel and those duties to be um, imposed on a range of um, statutory organisations. So it were, this, this ties in very neatly with that work and we will um, report back to the Health and Wellbeing Board um, as that work and readiness for the new legislation um, is put into place. Um, before I do my last update, I'll leave you hanging as to what the last update might be. Um, Jackie Jeffrey said that she'd like to come back on that um, on that funding bid piece that um, uh, Vanessa mentioned. So Jackie, um, if you could just introduce yourself and uh, explain to us, please. Yeah, uh, Jackie Jeffrey, and I'm the uh, one a member of the voluntary sector assembly. Um, we have talked about this particular funding stream um, initially. Uh, there's just a capacity issue, um, and I just want to make this. I know everyone's been wonderful about the the community and voluntary sector and the praise that we've had and our ability to respond. But just giving money isn't. We are really struggling with the capacity to deliver anything new. There's an issue with the COVID response money is very short term, so many voluntary sector organisations are facing a fiscal cliff come May, April, May. So it was good that this is April, but you know we haven't been able to respond to the carers contract that went out for commissioning. Um, uh, Age UK are completely over um, dedicated to, to sorting out the winter um, uh, services um, response. Our ability to to rise to the challenge of new mo of money is, is 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 an issue. We just don't have the capacity, um, and it's not that no one are interested. But you know, I'm I'm just want to hang it out there. <laughs> okay, Jackie. Um, I think that I'm, I I I respect that absolutely, and um, I think it's important that we understand as a board 
that um you know it uh, money isn't money isn't always the solution and um there's a range of factors that affect um all of our abilities to um to respond and continue to support the um the communities that we represent which is why i think going back to that piece earlier around um the infrastructure and the um resilience of community and voluntary sector organizations is so vital because um you, you, unless unless you have a robust structure to your organization then um you can't hope to build that capacity and so um that's as important as ever it was so yeah, thank you jackie for that it's people you can't you can look to the voluntary sector for us to do stuff but not for everything you know when <laughs> that's all i'm saying <laughs> yeah absolutely jackie no i i i respect that absolutely right so um my last item on the um agenda on my updates um is that um you have all had an email from my uh colleague uh val cross relating to um the solly hull approach to understanding trauma and it's an online course now as a health and well-being board you'll be aware that trauma and adverse childhood experiences have been identified as a um as a priority for the board quite rightly what we're looking for is we're looking for as many members of pos as members of the board as possible if you haven't already um to to do to go through this online course um it's free to all professionals with a work-based postcode in Shropshire um and so if you if you know of colleagues who would benefit from this, please feel free to share. But um, if I could ask as many of you to um, complete that, um, then that would be greatly appreciated. And I have no more items in the chat for members of the board requesting to speak. Um, so I will close by saying that um, I I've appreciate everyone's patience today. We've had a number of um, issues and speakers who weren't able to join us because of um, uh, IT issues, and that's always regrettable. Um, but we have managed to um, cover the items of the agenda. We've covered some extremely interesting topics. Um, I wish everyone um, the best of mental and physical health. Um, take very good care of yourselves, and I will formally close the meeting. Thank you very much. Thanks, Lee. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Lee.